What if Count Dooku executed Aura 65 on Palpatine? What would happen then? Let's find out. So in this timeline, very early on in their partnership, Dooku realizes that Palpatine would most likely betray him one day. This realization came to Dooku after the death of Qui-Gon Jinn, and that is because in this timeline, just like in the original timeline, Dooku did confront Palpatine after Qui-Gon died, accusing him of allowing Maul to kill Qui-Gon. To this, Palpatine would say that he too lost an apprentice, and that it's all in service to their greater goal, implying that everyone around them, even those closest, are nothing more than tools to be used and discarded. This discussion eventually led to Palpatine saying that he's always questioning Dooku's loyalty. And in the original timeline, Dooku probably proved his loyalty by killing Master Yaddle, who had followed Dooku there. Dooku would do the same in this timeline as well, but here, Dooku would leave this meeting with Palpatine, accepting the reality that his master only cared for himself and his goal. Nothing and no one else. Not even him. So this realization would cause Dooku to make some changes to the clone army's creation on Kamino, to enact a safeguard, a contingency against his own master's inevitable betrayal. So side note, the inhibitor chips that forced the clones to execute Order 66, they were created and delivered to the Kaminoans by Dooku. To explain how that happened, we have to talk about Sifo-Dyas, who had ordered the creation of the clone army. So Jedi Master sifo had a premonition that the Republic would soon need an army to fight in a great war. The Jedi Council dismissed this premonition by sifo and so he took matters into his own hands and ordered the creation of the clone army. And Dooku found out about this, and after having sifo killed, Dooku essentially took command of the operation, presenting himself to the Kaminoans as just another Jedi. The Kaminoans believed this, and possibly at Dooku's behest, they kept his name, which they believe was Tyrannus, a secret from the other Jedi later on. Anyways, Dooku eventually gave the Kaminoans the inhibitor chips, telling them that these chips were there to allow the clones to go after rogue Jedi if necessary. And that is how the inhibitor chips made their way into the clones. Anyways, coming back to the story, to make sure that Palpatine can't so easily dispose of him, Dooku makes some alterations to the inhibitor chips in this timeline. He makes it so that the chips, and in turn the clones, would recognize the authority of Darth Tyrannus as well as Darth Sidious. This means that along with Palpatine, Dooku too would have the authority to execute Order 66, and also the other 149 clone orders, which included Order 65, which would turn the clones against the Supreme Chancellor instead of the Jedi. Also, Dooku would not have revoked Sidious or Palpatine's authority just in case Palpatine wanted to test a clone or two for the chips of activeness. And so the clone army would be built in this manner, and everything would go similarly to the original timeline until Palpatine goes over with Dooku, his plans for getting kidnapped by Grievous and being rescued by Skywalker. Dooku would not realize it at the time, but later, the Force would connect all the dots for Dooku, and he would think back to the conversation he had with Palpatine when Qui-Gon died, about how nonchalant Palpatine was when his apprentice, Darth Maul, had died. Dooku would realize at this moment that it was now his turn to die in service to their, no, Palpatine's greater goal. But Dooku had seen this coming for years now, and he had prepared well. It's time my apprenticeship ended, master. Dooku would say to himself. Later on, Dooku did go along with Palpatine's plan, setting the stage for Grievous to invade Coruscant and kidnap Palpatine. This was a crucial part of Palpatine's grand scheme, intended to manipulate Anakin Skywalker further into his web. Yet, for Dooku, it was the perfect opportunity to execute his own secret agenda without raising any suspicions. By adhering to Palpatine's plan, Dooku masked his true intentions ensuring that Palpatine felt secure and in control of the situation. And so, as Coruscant fell under siege, chaos enveloped the city. Republic forces scrambled to defend their capital against the sudden onslaught. Amidst the blaring alarms and the clatter of blaster fire, General Grievous, with his imposing form and mechanical precision, led the charge towards the Senate building. His target, Chancellor Palpatine, who at this point was inside his office in the Republic Executive Building. Surrounded by a multitude of clones, and many Jedi who were sent there to protect him. And as Grievous' destroyed forces began infiltrating Palpatine's office, Jedi Master Shakti, who was tasked with protecting the Chancellor, engaged in a fierce battle with the separate destroyers. Her lightsaber moved in a blur, deflecting bolts and cutting down her adversaries. And inside his lavish office, Palpatine watched all this with a veneer of concern, playing the part of the besieged leader, all the while anticipating his later rescue by Anakin. But suddenly, beneath his calm exterior, a flicker of unease stirred as he sensed an unusual disturbance in the force. It was a subtle shift, almost imperceptible, 
but to a Sith Lord finally attuned to the dark side, it was a glaring alarm. Without warning, the clones stationed around him, who were supposed to be his loyal protectors, suddenly stiffened. Their expressions, hidden behind their helmets, were unreadable, yet a palpable change in their demeanor sent a chill through Palpatine. He could almost feel their wills aligning, stepping into a new command with a mechanical precision, an unnatural uniformity that spoke of their inhibitor tips being triggered. Palpatine's eyes narrowed as the realization dawned on him. This was not part of his plan. And then, the clones took aim. Not at the droids, but at Palpatine. Not all the clones, because they still had to fend off the droids, but a good number of clones pointed their blasters directly at Palpatine. Palpatine felt the roll surge of the dark side swell within him, anger fueling his power. His eyes, betraying a glimpse of the darkness within him, locked onto the nearest clone. Betrayal from my own creation, he hissed under his breath. The irony, bitter even to him. But before he could tap further into the dark side to unleash his wrath, the clones opened fire. Their blaster bolts were relentless. Despite the Jedi's best efforts, the sheer volume of the fire overwhelmed their defenses. Shakti grimaced as she sensed not just the imminent physical threat, but also the deep well of anger Palpatine was drawing from, a dark side energy she had never felt so powerfully before. But she ignored it, as they had slightly bigger concerns at the time. Protect the Chancellor, Shakti shouted, her voice resonant with urgency. The Jedi then surrounded Palpatine. But one by one, her fellow Jedi fell. Not to lethal ammunition, but to stun blasts. The clones were not targeting the Jedi, they were merely obstacles. And so, in this manner, the Jedi were picked up systematically using stun blasts, their defenses breaking down as each was incapacitated. Shakti was the last to remain, her resolve unyielding until a final stun blast caught her off guard, causing her to slump to the ground, unconscious, her lightsaber slipping from her grasp. Now unprotected and facing his betrayers alone, Palpatine's fury manifested through surges of force lightning. He deflected several blaster bolts even without a lightsaber, his powers palpable in the air. But the clones were relentless and organized. For the Republic, they chanted as they closed in. Die, traitorous scum, another clone yelled, reflecting how the inhibitor tips now made them see Palpatine as a traitor. And despite Palpatine's efforts to repel the attack, the volume of fire was overwhelming. The clones formed a tight firing squad, their blasters aligned with lethal intent. Palpatine again managed to deflect many shots, but as his energy waned, more bolts found their mark. His body jerked violently with each impact. The force of the blasts, too much, even for a Sith Lord. As the final shots rang out, Palpatine fell, his form crumbling to the ground amidst the echoes of the clone's chilling declarations. His robes were scorched, and his body was riddled with holes, the blaster damage extensive and fatal. As Shakti came to, her senses returning as the echoes of blaster fire filled the air, she blinked, trying to focus, and the sight that greeted her was grim. Chancellor Palpatine lay a short distance away, his once authoritative figure now motionless and marred by blaster fire. His body perforated with numerous holes, much like the notorious Haldranian cheese known across the galaxy for its many holes. Around her, the clones had resumed their fight against the invading droids. Their earlier mutiny against Palpatine seemingly a temporary shift in their program loyalty. As she staggered to her feet, one of the clones noticed her movement. Instead of raising his weapon, he approached cautiously. Master Jedi, are you injured? He asked. He stood respectful, yet tinged with confusion, as if unaware of his own recent actions against the Jedi and the Chancellor. I am fine, Shakti managed, steadying herself with her lightsaber. And as she witnessed the clone going back to fighting against the droids, memories of Clone Trooper Top and fives came to her mind. Top had experienced some form of malfunction in his inhibitor tip, which led to him executing a Jedi. And this incident, where Palpatine was assassinated by clones, appeared to be a similar, though far more devastating anomaly. Meanwhile, Habo Coruscant, aboard his flagship, Count Dooku oversaw the final stages of his meticulously planned betrayal. Before initiating Order 65, Dooku had taken a critical step to ensure its success. He had sliced into the Republic's communication networks, specifically targeting the bandwidths used by the military. This isolation allowed him to transmit the execute command for Order 65 to a small subset of clones stationed in the Senate region, ensuring no widespread activation that could jeopardize his precise strike against Palpatine. And then, a few moments after executing the order, Count Dooku received an urgent transmission from Grievous. The cyborg's mechanical voice was laced with a mixture of surprise and uncertainty. Count. The droids report that the Chancellor 
has been eliminated by his own protectors, the clones. Dooku paused, processing the news with a cold detachment. Confirm the kill, he ordered Grievous. And moments later, Grievous did confirm the kill. It's true, Palpatine is dead, he said. Then withdraw your forces immediately, General, Dooku commanded. Our objective has been achieved. Leave Coruscant. Grievous tried to argue, sensing the opportunity to inflict more damage, but Dooku was unyielding. That is an order, General. Execute the retreat. Reluctantly, the cyborg general issued the commands to pull back, and soon the Separatist forces began their withdrawal from the besieged Republic capital. With Grievous' forces pulling back, Dooku reflected on the broader implications of his actions. The Jedi Order was undoubtedly in disarray, but the full impact of the clone's betrayal would come to light soon. Considering the activation of Order 66 as well, Dooku decided against a full implementation. The targeted execution of 65 was sufficient for now. So long, Sidious, Dooku murmured, as his ship prepared to jump to hyperspace. His figure, silhouetted against the stars, was pensive. The galaxy had shifted beneath them all, and he had just sculpted a new landscape of power. As the star stretched into lines of light and his ship surged forward into hyperspace, Dooku contemplated his next moves in the new order he would shape. Meanwhile, in the remote edges of the Outer Rim, just like in the original timeline, Ahsoka Tano and Bo-Katan Kryze were briefing Anakin and Obi-Wan on a critical situation on Mandalore. Maul, the rogue Sith Lord, had taken control over the planet, and they sought the Jedi's assistance in toppling Maul's rule. In the original timeline, as Anakin and Obi-Wan were essentially discussing whether they should help, they were called back to Coruscant because Palpatine had been abducted. But that doesn't happen here. Instead, as Ahsoka and Bo-Katan were speaking with Anakin and Obi-Wan, the meeting was suddenly interrupted, when the two Jedi received an urgent communication. And as they answered the calmling, a hologram of Master Mace Windu materialized before them, his expression grave and urgent. Master Kenobi, Anakin, he began, his voice heavy with concern. There has been an unprecedented incident on Coruscant. General Grievous had tried to invade Coruscant. His intentions are not completely known, but we, but we assume it was to capture the Supreme Chancellor. At this point, Mace Windu, without sugarcoating anything, would tell Anakin and Obi-Wan the following. Chancellor Palpatine has been assassinated by a group of his own clone troopers during Grievous' invasion. The news struck Anakin like a physical blow. Palpatine had been more than a political leader to him. He had been a mentor, almost a father figure, guiding him through many personal and professional crises. Anakin felt his heart sink, a mix of grief and disbelief clouding his thoughts. Obi-Wan, ever composed, sought more information. Mace, how did this happen? Are we sure about the details? Yes, Obi-Wan, the initial reports are confirmed through multiple sources, including the holonet. The clones involved are currently in custody. They claim to have been following orders from Tyrannus, Mace explained. His brow furrowed in confusion. Tyrannus? Dooku is behind this? Anakin's voice cracked, his anger rising from the pit of his stomach. It appears so, but the clones themselves are confused, claiming that they were just following orders. They're trying to make sense of it all, Mace continued. The discussions went on for longer, but unlike in the original timeline, neither Anakin nor Obi-Wan were called back to Coruscant. And then eventually, Mace Windu's hologram faded, leaving a heavy silence in its wake. Anakin paced back and forth, his mind racing, the weight of loss evident in his every move. Obi-Wan and Ahsoka, who had also been witness to Mace Windu's transmission, exchanged worried glances with Obi-Wan. Ahsoka approached Anakin gently, placing a hand on his shoulder in a comforting gesture. Anakin will capture Dooku, justice will be served, she reassured him, her voice soft yet firm. Obi-Wan nodded in agreement. Dooku's treachery will not go unpunished, Obi-Wan said. Anakin suddenly stopped pacing as if his mind had completed processing something. Maul is also a Sith. Capturing him might give us more insight into Dooku's plans and possibly even lead us straight to him, Anakin said as if completely ignoring everything that happened to Palpatine. Obi-Wan and Ahsoka figured from this that Anakin was in no mood to discuss what he was going through. So instead, they set their course to Mandalore, to Maul. And soon enough, Anakin, Obi-Wan and Ahsoka, and their clone forces, and bo along with her Mandalorian resistance, were all headed towards the capital city of Sundari on Mandalore, to confront Maul and defeat him. The journey was tense, each member of the team lost in their own thoughts about the recent events and the battles that lay ahead. Upon their arrival at the tumultuous capital of Mandalore, Sundari, the atmosphere was thick with urgency and the air reverberated with the sounds of ongoing conflict. As Anakin, Obi-Wan, Ahsoka and their clones disembarked, they were met by Ursao Ren, a member of Bo-Katan's Night Owl division of Mandalorians. 
Anyways, Hoza Ren, with a grave expression, quickly briefed them. Moal was last seen entering the tunnels beneath Sundari. We believe he is using them to coordinate the defense and possibly escape if overwhelmed, Ursa said. Bogota nodded sharply, her focus unswerving. I'll confront Dalmek in the Grand Hall. His loyalty to Mole might make him divulge the true extent of their plans, Bokitan said to Ursa. And then, turning to the Jedi on the thorns, she said the following, Take care in the tunnels. Mole is cunning and he might be familiar with the tunnels layout. Dividing their forces strategically, Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka, and a contingent of clones, descended into the labyrinthine tunnels under the city. The dimly lit corridors echoed ominously, a stark contrast to the chaos above. But suddenly, the silence in the tunnels was punctuated by distant echoes and the faint sounds of movement. Stay sharp, Anakin whispered. His senses heightened. Obi-Wan nodded in agreement, his eyes scanning the dark recesses of the tunnel. Ahsoka, ever vigilant, kept her hands on her lightsabers, ready to react at a moment's notice. As they progressed, it became increasingly evident that Maul might be luring them deeper into a trap. This suspicion grew as sporadic sounds echoed through various offshoots of the tunnel system, and one by one, clones began to disappear, picked up silently and efficiently, just as they were in the original family. And realizing the peril they were in, Anakin called for a change in tactics. Split up, he instructed. We'll cover more ground and reduce the chance of a single devastating ambush. Obi-Wan and Ahsoka acknowledged the command, each taking a contingent of clones in different directions to engage Maul's forces. This suppression, however, proved challenging. The Mandalorian Super Commandos, loyal to Maul, were exceptionally familiar with the tunnels, and used this knowledge to orchestrate their attacks. Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka found themselves engaging in fierce skirmishes, eliminating several of Maul's fighters, but at the cost of further thinning their own numbers. The echoing blaster fire and the hum of lightsabers filled the tunnels with a deadly symphony. As the Jedi and Ahsoka led their group through the twisting passages, they were systematically herded towards a large junction within the tunnel network, a vast open space where multiple corridors converged. Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka converged at this junction, each arriving from different tunnels. With only Captain Rex and a handful of clones remaining, the situation was dire. They quickly formed a defensive circle, backs together facing outwards in all directions. The tension was palpable, each of them keenly aware of the trap that had snared them. The dim lights illuminating this tunnel junction flickered as shadows moved fluidly around them. From the darkness, the distinct clank of Mandalorian armors approached, and soon most Mandalorian super commandos encircled the Jedi and the remaining clones. Their weapons trained on the group with deadly precision, as Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka readied their lightsabers prepared to take on Maul's forces head-on. But then, before anything else could happen, Maul stepped into the light, his presence menacing as he surveyed the Jedi. Welcome, Jedi, he sneered, his voice echoing off the stone walls. You seem to have lost your way. Surrounded and clearly at a disadvantage, Anakin's frustrations and anger boiled over. He glared at Maul, his voice thunderous as he demanded, Tell us everything you know about Darth Tyrannus. I swear, Maul, I will end you here if you don't speak. Maul, unfazed by Skywalker's threat, allowed a slight smirk to cross his face. Until very recently, Skywalker, I would have relished the chance to engage you in a duel to the death, but given recent developments, my plans have indeed changed. At this point, Ahsoka, confused and slightly curious, stepped forward slightly. And what developments would that be, Maul? she asked. With a theatric pause, Maul's gaze swept across the clones of the Jedi. Surely you must have heard. The Chancellor is dead, killed by his own protectors, no less. Anakin's reaction was immediate and visceral, his voice a mixture of pain and disbelief. What do you care about that, Maul? Maul appeared contemplative, almost introspective, as if pondering the weight of his words before he spoke. I did not think it possible, and yet, it seems I was wrong. Obi-Wan, ever the mediator and growing tired of Maul's enigmatic responses, interjected sharply. Enough of your cryptic nonsense, Maul. This isn't some whole on mystery drama where you play the shadowy figure with all the answers. Speak plainly, Obi-Wan said. Palpatine was Darth Sidious, my former master. And he is now dead, Maul said as if he were offended. In the dim, echoing towns beneath Sundari, this revelation about Palpatine's true identity hung heavy in the air. Anakin, grappling with the disbelief and betrayal, was the first to react. What? He demanded. His voice thick with emotion. You lie. Maul's expression remained composed, his gaze cold and calculating. 
I have no reason to lie, Skywalker. Sidious, or Palpatine as you know him, was my master before he discarded me for Dooku after my failure on Naboo. Maul's eyes briefly locked with Obi-Wan's as he said this, acknowledging their past with a flicker of resentment. Maul then continued, his tone reflecting a mix of reflection and a strategic thought. Palpatine has been watching you for a long time, Skywalker. He planned to replace Dooku with you. Yet, it seems Dooku saw that betrayal coming. How exactly did Palpatine die? Maul asked. Obi-Wan answered, his voice steady despite the tension. The claws turned against him. It appears they were compelled to do so. Maul's interest deepened. Why turn on him? Obi-Wan hesitated to answer. But then he figured that if he was able to stall Maul, then that could give them time for reinforcements to arrive. Their transmissions had been jammed, but Obi-Wan figured that not getting a response from them for so long would trigger the clones up above to come into the tunnels. And with that reasoning in mind, Obi-Wan said the following. There was an incident before. A clone trooper, Tup, killed a Jedi when his inhibitor tip malfunctioned. It led to an investigation by another clone, Fives, who believed he uncovered something alarming. And having said this much, Obi-Wan turned his attention to Rex, seeing as how Rex could better explain the situation with Fives. And as a result, Rex, who had been listening intently, added, his tone laden with regret. Fires claimed he discovered that the inhibitor chips might be engineered for more than just obedience. He said they could be used to force us against the Jedi, for example. He also suspected Palpatine was somehow involved, but he was killed before he could prove anything. Anakin's face tightened hearing this, memories of Fives, a clone trooper he fought beside and respected, flashing through his mind. Inhibitor chip? Maul inquired, seizing on this new information. Yes, Rex confirmed, the doubt and confusion clear in his voice. All clones have them. They're supposed to prevent us from disobeying orders. Fice believed they could be designed to make us turn against the Jedi on command. Maul considered this, his expression thoughtful. So this chip caused the clones to turn on the Jedi, and now the Chancellor. It sounds like a plan, not a malfunction. A little too convenient, Maul said. Curious about the broader implications, Maul pressed further. Who created this army? Jedi. And how? And Obi-Wan, still wanting to stall Maul, reluctantly shared more. The clone army itself was a mystery to the Jedi until about three years ago. It was ordered by Jedi Master Saifa Deus, who was assassinated shortly after he ordered the clone army's creation. We only discovered the army's existence during a mission to Kamino, the clone homeworld. Obi-Wan then continued, recalling his investigation to Kamino right before the Clone Wars. When I visited Kamino on an important mission, I learned that the genetic template for the clones, Django Fett, was recruited by a man named Tyrannus. We've only recently discovered that Tyrannus is Dooku, and that he may have had involvement in Sifo-Dyas' death. The exact alterations Dooku may have made aren't fully known to the Jedi. It's clear now that there's much we don't see. And having heard this, Maul said the following, Tyrannus, Dooku, had a hand in creating your army. Maul appeared genuinely surprised, Obi-Wan nodded adding, it seems so, but the clones have proven to be loyal men. The Jedi Council trusts them. Hearing this, Maul looked at them for a long, silent moment before making a piercing observation. Did you ever consider the possibility that an army that you didn't know existed, an army created by Darth Tyrannus, complete with inhibitors that forced them to act against their will, might be a little suspicious? Obi-Wan remained silent, the implication of Maul's words sinking in deeply. Reflecting further, Maul summarized his thoughts. These chips were likely there so that the clones could be used against the Jedi. It's the perfect weapon. The fact that this top turned on this Jedi commander was possibly due to this chip getting activated somehow. How could you not see this? This plot was most likely orchestrated by my master and this Darth Tyrannus. But now it appears Darth Tyrannus saw an opportunity and has betrayed Darth Sidious using his own weapon. If this is the trap the Jedi have fallen into, perhaps the Force itself seeks your end. Maul's tone was placed with amusement as he contemplated the dire implications. This held for the Jedi. And then, with a flare of anger, Maul asserted the following. If what you told me holds true, Dooku has now control of both Republic and Separatist forces. He could use them against the Republic and the Jedi at any moment. And having heard this, Obi-Wan, ever the optimist, responded firmly. We can stop Dooku. We must. Maul shook his head, his expression grim. 
You have already lost. You are dead men walking. I am leaving Mandalore Jedi. You will all be dead soon anyway. Anakin, frustration and desperation mounting, yelled at Maul to stop moving. But Maul was already turning away, his cloak swirling around him. And upon seeing Anakin rushing towards him, with a swift gesture, Maul unleashed a powerful force push, slamming Anakin, Obi-Wan, Ahsoka, and the clone staffer with him against the tunnel wall. As they struggled to regain their footing, Maul's voice echoed one last time through the tunnels. Dooku has no need for you, Skywalker. I'd be careful if I were you. It appeared as though Maul's voice was coming from different directions, and then it vanished. Maul and his Mandalorian super commandos were gone, leaving the Jedi with the heavy silence of their thoughts. Rex, visibly shaken and overwhelmed by the revelations and their implications, began to pace, his suggestions becoming increasingly drastic. General, if what Maul says is true, we need to want the Jedi Council immediately. We should separate all clones from the Jedi. It's the only way to ensure no more betrayals. Anakin, placing a calm hand on Rex's shoulder, interjected with a steady voice. We'll figure this out, Rex. We always do. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan wasted no time contacting the Jedi Council to relay the dire findings that they had uncovered. His report included Maul's claims that Palpatine was in fact Darth Sidious and the troubling implications regarding the clone's potential to turn against the Jedi at any moment. The revelation that Palpatine was Sidious, according to Maul, did not shock the Council all that much. The reason for that is, Shakti had sensed the darkness within Palpatine as Palpatine was attacked by the clones, and on top of that, there were hollow recordings recovered where Palpatine was seen using Force Lightning to fight off the clones that were attacking him. And the implications regarding the clone's potential turn against the Jedi at any moment due to their inhibitor tips, that revelation did surprise the Council, although they did suspect that the clones were somehow being controlled by Tyrannus. Because again, along with the hollow recordings of Palpatine using Force Lightning, the Jedi Council also uncovered that the clones had received a transmission from Count Dooku telling them to execute Order 65. So basically, Obi-Wan's revelations only confirmed what the Council already knew by this point. And so, the Council now realizes that the clones could turn against them at any moment. They should have looked into what Five said. The entire Jedi Council regretted not doing so. And so, to Obi-Wan, the Council said to maintain a distance from the clones, and to make sure that the clones do not receive any transmissions from anywhere, to essentially turn off the trans receivers on the clone helmets. And so, ending the transmission, Obi-Wan turned to discuss the immediate steps with Rex, who frantically suggested removing the inhibitor chips from every single clone. However, that solution was quickly deemed impractical due to the sheer number of clones. Instead, they decided to go with the Council's Council to disable all external communications to the clone troopers. This would prevent Dooku from sending any commands that might trigger the clones to turn on the Jedi. Meanwhile, back on Coruscant, the Jedi Council deliberated on broader measures. They tried to enact a galaxy-wide blockade on transmissions to clone troopers to prevent any chance of Dooku executing a widespread activation of the inhibitor chips. But the Council soon found out that these measures would do little to help them because, almost concurrently with these preventive measures, reports started flooding in from the Outer Rim. Reports of how in the thick of numerous battles across the Outer Rim, even as many clones had entirely removed their helmets in an attempt to prevent any unsanctioned commands from influencing their actions, Dooku found a loophole. Massive holograms of Count Dooku were suddenly projected across the battlefields. In a commanding tone, Dooku declared the following, Execute Order 66. This symbol command effectively activated a deep-seated protocol within the clones, overriding their previous conditioning and loyalty. The sight and sound of Count Dooku was enough to compel the clone troopers to turn against their Jedi generals, recognizing Darth Tyrannus as their true leader, and effectively defecting to the Separatists. This horrifying scenario began to play out repeatedly. Battle after battle, the Jedi found themselves ambushed not by enemy forces, but by the very soldiers they had commanded. However, Obi-Wan Ahsoka and Anakin were safe, because this catastrophe did not occur on Mandalore, because there were no Separatist forces present there. And also after Maul left, the battle was quickly won by bo and her Mandalorian resistance. And so, bo quickly became regent of Mandalore, and upon the Jedi's request, bo provided space and facilitated the containment of the clone troopers. So basically, Mandalore was spared from Order 66. Anyways, on Coruscant, the Jedi Council absorbed the scale of the disaster. Yoda gazed over Coruscant, deeply troubled by their collective failure to see the threat before it was too late. Amidst this reflection, a transmission was received by the Jedi Temple, and it was from Count Dooku. 
and seeing as how there were no clone troopers present within the council chambers, this transmission was answered. And upon doing so, the holographic figure of Count Dooku materialized before the Jedi, his image casting a somber shadow across the council chamber. The Sith Lord stood with an air of calm authority, his gaze fixed directly on Master Yoda, Count Dooku's own former master. Master Yoda, the circle is now complete. Dooku began, his voice resonant with a cold clarity. Your oversight and the Jedi's blindness has allowed the Sith to return, the Republic to decay from within, and now to this, my ascension to control the galaxy. Dooku continued, detailing the extent of his control. The Republic's army no longer serves your cause. The allegiance of the clones has shifted. As you no doubt have heard, I now possess the ability to control your clone forces. A simple set of words from me will turn the clones against the Republic. This is the reality your complacency has brought, Master Yoda. Yoda, deeply troubled yet composed, responded with a gravitas that masked his ears. What is it that you seek, Dooku? Dooku's expression suffered slightly, hinting at the complex web of motivations behind his actions. I am no brute, Yoda. Trust me when I say that I do not wish to rule a galaxy of ash and bone. I seek peace, a new order where conflict is extinguished, but this peace will come at a cost. The Republic must surrender, and I must be instilled as its leader, as its new emperor. Yoda's eyes narrowed, wisdom and sorrow intermingling in his gaze. Decide this, we cannot. The sensibility is that guides the Republic, not the will of the Council. Dooku chuckled softly, a sound that held no joy. I intend to address the Senate Yoda. I merely desire to see how you, my old master, would react to the turn of events. Your principles are as I remember, but they have left the galaxy to the brink. With that, Dooku's image flickered slightly, signaling the end of the transmission. Consider this a new beginning, Master Yoda. For the good of all, I hope you will see reason. So a short while after this, Dooku addressed the Republic Senate in a way that was as calculated and commanding as his military maneuvers. But anyways, as Dooku addressed the Senate before the gathered representatives of the galaxy, Dooku declared his control over the Republic's clone army and presented a proposal for peace. He outlined a plan that promised stability and order, but at the cost of the Senate's unconditional surrender to his leadership. He gave the Senate three days to deliberate and respond, a deadline that underscored the urgency and inevitability of his proposal. And so, by this point, the Jedi and the Senate both realized the futility of resistance. If they engaged Dooku in battle, all Dooku needed was to say he execute Order 66 to turn the Republic's army against the Republic and against the Jedi. There was no way to counter this. They could try blocking transmissions, but this did not stop Dooku or General Grievous from being able to slice into anywhere they could essentially slice into and blasting a hologram of Dooku saying execute Order 66. Killing the clones wasn't an option because even if they managed to kill the millions of clones, that would still leave the Republic without an army. They could have tried blinding and deafening the clones, but then again, they would be equally ineffective. And as for removing the inhibitor chips, the sheer volume of clones made that impossible as well. So there was no practical solution to this problem. The only solution was surrendering to Dooku. And faced with this new reality, the Senate convened to discuss Dooku's terms. And this debate was short-lived. The overwhelming might of Dooku's control over the military left them with little choice. The Jedi Council too recognized the futility of further resistance. There are only a few thousand Jedi left now. Too few to fight the clones and the droids. Also, this matter had soon leaked to the general public of the galaxy as well, and the vast majority of them also recognized the futility of resisting the Separatist movement. And many of them even blamed the Jedi for their oversight, which led to the situation in the first place. And so, eventually, both the Senate and the Jedi Council agreed to Dooku's terms, acknowledging that to reject his proposal would only lead to further devastation and loss of life across the galaxy. Victory against Dooku was not possible by this point. And on top of that, the Clone Wars had drained the Republic, and the populace's desire for peace outweighed any small reservations the Senate had about conceding to Dooku's demands. Thus, the Senate issued a formal acceptance of Dooku's terms, appointing him as the new leader of the Republic. And so, soon enough, Dooku arrived on Coruscant, flanked by built droids and clone forces, and formally accepted the title as leader of the galaxy, which essentially meant emperor. The transition was marked by a significant shift in the galaxy's political landscape, ending the Clone Wars but beginning a new era under Dooku's rule. And in the wake of his ascension to power, 
Kaunduku addressed the combined assemblies of the former Republic Senate and the leaders of the separatist system. Standing in the Grand Chamber that had once echoed with the voices of democracy, Duku laid out his vision for a unified future under his rule. With a masterful blend of rhetoric and poise, Duku painted a picture of a galaxy where war was a relic of the past. He spoke of integration between separatist and republic systems, a system free of corporate control, promising to mend the rift that had torn the galaxy apart. We stand at the threshold of a new era, Duku proclaimed, an era where the fires of war yield to the light of peace. Both Republic and Separatists have paid dearly for our divisions, and it is time to rebuild together. And as the galaxy listened, many, worn and weary from years of conflict, found a glimmer of hope in Dooku's words. Even those within the former Republic who had viewed the Separatists with distrust felt a desperate yearning for the peace that Dooku promised. The war had drained everyone, and the allure of stability was too strong to resist. And as a result, Many across the galaxy, and many in the Senate, applauded Dooku when he outlined his plan. However, as the applause faded, Dooku's tone shifted. His gaze swept across the room, settling on a small contingent of Jedi, including Master Yoda, who had attended the session. Yet, we must address the architects of our suffering, Dooku continued, his voice hardening. The Jedi Order, once guardians of peace, turned commanders of war. They led your Republic into countless battles, not as peacemakers, but as warriors hungry for power. Their actions have caused millions of lives. They blindly listened to their corrupt commanders instead of leading the charge on peaceful negotiations. The chamber fell silent as Dooku said this, and then Dooku continued after a pause. Therefore, Dooku declared, I demand that the Jedi relinquish their roles in politics. They are to leave Coruscant immediately and exile themselves to the Outer Rim. Should they fail to comply, they will face the consequences. And again, redirecting his attention towards Yoda, he said the following. The only reason I'm not exterminating your entire order right now is because I want peace. I do not wish for more bloodshed. But I cannot tolerate the existence of your order within this new era of peace that I wish to build. And so you must leave, Jedi, he said. The ultimatum sent ripples through the assembly. Many believed Dooku's charges against the Jedi. The war had blurred the lines of morality and duty. Dooku even went on to argue that Palpatine was evil, and that the Jedi blindly followed him. The Jedi could have tried arguing that Dooku and Palpatine were in it together, and that they orchestrated the Clone Wars, but they had little evidence to prove it. There were of course the old recordings of Palpatine using lightning and what Shakti felt, but most of the galaxy knew nothing of the power of the Force. But even then, Dooku could have countered that he was never in league with Palpatine and that the Jedi had grown so corrupt that they began siding with the Sith. But even if the Jedi managed to convince the entire galaxy that Dooku and Palpatine were responsible for the war, that would not have changed the fact that Dooku had complete control over two armies, the droids and the clones. So in the end, the Jedi, cornered and powerless, had little choice but to comply to Dooku's demand to leave Coruscant. Their influence had waned, and with Dooku's control over the military, resisting his decree was tantamonious to self-destruction. And so, within days, the Jedi Order began the somber process of evacuating the galactic capital. Their departure from Coruscant, a planet that they had called home for over 25,000 years at this point, was met with mixed emotions by the galaxy at large. And as for where the Jedi went, well, Boca Tanakris, the newly appointed regent of Mandalore, was more than happy to accommodate a few thousand Jedi, as she hoped that this would eventually, in time, strengthen her people. Mandalorian Jedi became an interesting prospect. Bo-Katan. And on top of that, she was also grateful for the Jedi's efforts in liberating Mandalore from Maul's tyranny. We must go to the aid of those who came to ours. This was essentially bo sentiment, at least publicly. And so the Jedi Order went to Mandalore and bo provided them with everything they needed to restart their order on Mandalore. Again, bo wasn't doing this entirely out of the kindness of her heart, but the Jedi had no choice at the moment than to take up on bo offer. And so, the Jedi began their new order on Mandalore. And as for why Dooku did this instead of wiping out the entirety of the Jedi Order with Order 66, well, there were a few reasons. So Dooku was a former Jedi, and he was someone who was familiar with the intricacies of galactic politics and galactic history. So Dooku knew that the way he presented himself before the galaxy was important, because if he did not present himself in the right way, that could form rebellions. And rebellions, as galactic history had taught Dooku, were dangerous, and the best way to quell any rebellion was just to give them what they wanted. So here, 
the galaxy wanted peace, and so he gave them peace. If he had instead opted to wipe out the Jedi, many would have come to believe that Dooku wanted to conquer, not to bring peace, and that would have led to rebellions forming, which would have taken time for Dooku to quell. And another reason was that Dooku wanted his former master, Master Yoda, to see and fully experience what his failure had led to. Because Dooku left the Order because of how he felt the Order was becoming slaves to corporations. And Dooku wanted the Order and his leader, Master Yoda, to see how this corruption which Yoda failed to resolve led to the galaxy coming under the control of Dooku. And even beyond that, you gotta remember that Dooku has the plans for the Death Star. So he does plan to build that. And in this timeline, with Dooku not killing every single Separatist leader and having the entirety of the galaxy under his control, would have the Death Star built by Geonosians, not by scientists like Gale and Erso. So Dooku knows that soon the Death Star will be operational, and that he'd be able to quell any rebels or threat that he may face. If the Jedi on Mandalore ever spoke against him, he could simply use the Death Star on Mandalore and wipe out the threat right then and there. So in essence, the Jedi were no threat to him. Dooku knew this. He had the clones, the droids, and pretty soon a Death Star. And quite possibly multiple Death Stars because the Geonosians, they'd be building it faster than any of Palpatine scientists could ever build it. So basically that is why Dooku let the Jedi live on. It helped him present himself as a peaceful ruler, it prevented rebellions from being formed, and at the end of the day, the Jedi were no threat to Dooku. And so that was the state of the galaxy as Dooku took command. Also, in case you're wondering what happened to Obi-Wan, Ahsoka, and Anakin after they report to the Council of Moore's findings, well, they stayed on Mandalore because they soon figured that it was a pretty safe place to stay because there were no Separatists there and all the clones on Mandalore were successfully quarantined due to Bo-Katan's efforts. But Anakin obviously wanted to go to Coruscant because of Padme, but Obi-Wan told him that him being around Padme might put her in danger because if somehow the clones made Anakin a target, Padme might also get caught in the crossfire, so to keep her safe, Obi-Wan urged Anakin to stay on Mandalore, and so he did. And then later, when the entirety of the Jedi Order relocated to Mandalore, and Count Dooku took power, Anakin still wasn't able to go to Coruscant because of the Jedi ban, but Padme did travel to Mandalore and meet with Anakin. And eventually Luke and Leia were born, and once they were found out to be Force-sensitive, Padme reluctantly made the decision to send them to Mandalore so they could be trained as Jedi. But Padme herself, well, she remained on Coruscant, because the only other thing that Padme loved beyond Anakin was the collective voice of the galaxy, and she believed she had to stay in the newly formed Imperial Senate to make sure that the voice of the galaxy was heard as much as possible. And as for what happened to the clone army, well, seeing as how in this timeline the Jedi didn't have the resources to remove the inhibitors from every single clone, they all had to go away from the Jedi, even the ones on Mandalore. But a few clones like Rex and Cody did manage to get their chips removed with the help of Mandalorian technology, so a few of them managed to stay back, but the rest left the Jedi and went to the core worlds, mainly Coruscant. And Count Dooku didn't stop their protection after the war ended because he felt pretty secure having both clones and droids by his side. And so that was the state of things. And if he went even further, that would make this video hours long and maybe I'll make a part two eventually. But what do you think would happen? The way the story stands, there is nothing that could oppose Dooku. But at the end of the day, everything in the Star Wars galaxy is up to the will of the Force. And... If the Force wanted Dooku gone, he would be gone. But what do you think? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. And goodbye. Have an awesome day. Stay hydrated and check out my Patreon. If you have the time, link is in the description. And all of you make good decisions in life. Goodbye.